Hi, everyone. Welcome to Heron Project Live. I am your host, Kevin Michael Azik. Thank you for all tuning in tonight. We have a fantastic show lined up for you. We have Greg Nance Jeepers, from all the way out in Washington, Seattle, outside, or he's actually on an island outside of Washington, Seattle. So we have him tuning in tonight, and he is about to embark on an epic adventure in April. Um, so we'll talk about that. And we also have my good buddy, Matt Ganim, the poet, um, who just opened his own treatment center in Massachusetts. So he'll be joining us in a little bit. A couple of Heron Project related announcements. Um, I want to thank Izzy B too for our snazzy count countdown clock prior to the show. She created that. And she will be also joining Kristen Young tomorrow for our uh, Lunch and Learn which is at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. You can register for that on our Facebook page or also on our website, but they will be discussing prevention, um, which is a super important topic and something that we focus on here at Heron Project with our Heron Project clubs, but be sure to register and tune in for that. It will be a great show for sure. Also, our holiday appeal is coming up. It will be kicking off with Giving Tuesday, which is December 1st this year. So we will once again be asking for your trust and your support. Um, this year has been extremely challenging um, for us as an organization. You know, more people are struggling, more people are reaching out, and we are fighting the good fight every day. But we need your support more than ever. As a lot of you know, a lot of our races have been canceled. So we will be asking you for your continued support. We're also gonna add a peer-to-peer -peer element to it this year. So more will be coming out about that. But as always, thank you for always supporting our organization and allowing us to serve thousands and thousands of families, individuals and students all across this country. So I'm gonna bring in our first guest, Greg Nance. Hey, Greg, how are you? Doing awesome, Kevin, great to be here. Glad to have you. So I know you you connected with us through the connector, Pam Rickard, and you are in recovery yourself. And in April of next year, you're going to be embarking on a 3,000 mile trek all across the country. Probably it's more than 3,000, right? A little bit more than 3,000. I got to say, I am I am like triply inspired right now. That like intro music, that was great. I got goosebumps from that. Uh, Pam Rickard is a force of nature. That's how I've connected with this wonderful community here and just so fired up to, to be here to share a little bit about me and my mission and to connect with this wonderful community. We have a rule here on Heron Project Live. You can only give Pam two compliments. <laughs> okay, I'm done. You do have one. <laughs> But she is the best. She is a force for good. You said it. She is definitely a force for good. And she's done tremendous work for our organization. So tell us about the run that you're planning and how it kind of came about. Yeah. So April 4th, I'm trying to run across the United States from New York City to my hometown of Seattle. It's about a 3,000 mile run. And it's to celebrate 3,000 days clean and sober. Um, from age 16 to 23, I actually was struggling with um, alcoholism and with an opiate addiction. Um, and yeah, a lot of big uh, challenges there, but I wasn't able, I didn't have the maturity to really acknowledge that uh, at the time I was in a state of denial and relapse after relapse after relapse, I kept making the same mistakes. And only by the grace of God do I find my first steps in recovery. And somehow I'm 3000 days in, I want to, to honor that journey, celebrate those 3000 days of life and hopefully inform and inspire folks along the way. Um, I'm actually meeting with the documentary film team and we're aiming to explore America's addiction epidemic to better understand this silent epidemic. You know, COVID is getting all the front page press, but many of us, 40 million Americans are dealing with substance uh, abuse and addiction, and it's worse now than ever. A lot of the early data showing, and want to do something about that. And what a wonderful community here to uh, to partner to ally um, with this common cause. Awesome! I got a little finger happy there. <laughs> Long buttons. I was like, oh no, <laughs> no he's he's gone. <laughs> Big shout out to Dana who is uh, tuning in from Detox. Dana, we're with you. And you got this. Soba is better, and you are definitely worth it. So keep up the good work. We're proud of you, and thank you for tuning in. 
but they know. So Greg, you're in recovery. Kind of, can you tell us a little bit about your story and what kind of finally led you to reach out for help and change? Yeah. So I, I was, you know, I'm one of these guys where you wouldn't have thought anything was wrong. Seeing me as a teenager, a guy in his young twenties, I really nice community, great family, all these opportunities, an athlete, you know, student leader, all this. Uh, but, uh, losing my granddad when I was 16 was really, really hard on me. And I wasn't able to really process those feelings without the help of alcohol. And alcohol, of course, can lead to other things, which it did for me only at age 23, after I had you know, relapsed a hundred times and knew I was on the wrong path, but had to keep making bigger and bigger and bigger mistakes until, you know, it all kind of blows up on me. And uh, in my case, I actually had a, I had a scholarship to go to business school, my dream you know, opportunity. And yet I've spent um, my scholarship stipend, not on books and on, you know, rent and all this, but instead, uh, drinking and drugging and the provost, um, you know, brought me to his office and literally, you know, calls me a disgrace. And that, uh, that ended up being a turning point for me. Cause I, I really had nowhere else to go. I was out of money and I, I want to get my life back on track. Um, and for me, it was lacing up my running shoes. So I was still too stubborn, too much ego, to admit I had a problem. And so I, I want to just kind of run from that. And that's what I did. So with white knuckles headed out and with these shoes laced up, built a daily running ritual. And that's been a cornerstone of uh, my recovery in the year since. And only in the last two years, actually, have I been able to acknowledge, hey, like I actually absolutely this, this was and is addiction. And I want to build a much deeper foundation in recovery. And as we all know, it's community is a huge part of that and being able to talk through the things that you're feeling and experiencing and then being there to support one another. Um, that's been amazing for me. I feel like I'm, I'm in a much, much better place in recovery the last you know two years that I've been you know more open about this and acknowledging of these mistakes I've made and trying to make amends going forward by, uh, by being in the community and, and connecting. And uh, the community piece is so critical and I can't stop thinking about Dana sitting in detox, you know, watching this, um, but, you know, for me, that community aspect of this was critical, you know, meeting people that were like minded and in recovery and, you know, someone I could, you know, turn to. So, Dana, um, you know, keep it up. And when you get out of there, you got to find a community and network and jump right in. It's worth it. Absolutely. And it's so much better and more fulfilling with that community, too. So, Dana. Um, you got this. The first steps are the hardest. You're doing it right now. They're in detox. And the courage, too. I would have never been able to put myself out there like that. That's huge. So how are you going to break up the run? I always get like fascinated by you crazy people that come up with these long runs. of How, how are you planning on breaking it up? Yeah. So you, you eat an elephant one bite at a time. And it's, it's the same deal trying to run across the country. So I, I'm a one step in front of the next kind of guy. Um, I, I also love to eat. You can't really tell by looking at me, but I've never missed a meal. And that that is going to be how I track all this. So I'm um, going to have probably four real big meals a day. And it's really just, you know, that's my incentive. Keep running, keep running, keep running, and then let's feast. And so I, I call it beast mode to feast mode. And that, you know, those four meals each day are, are the sustenance that gives you the fuel. And it also is a little bit of the, the reprieve where, hey, I'm going to get a rest while I have like a delicious pizza or you know, a chicken pot pie or whatever is next on the menu. So that's a little bit how I approach it, but ultimately it's, it's get to that next telephone pole or that next tree or that fence and really just break it down to the small pieces. And that's how you run, you know, 45 miles a day over you know 65 days to, to cross the country. So if I get this right, so you could basically run across the country eating like crap. <laughs> yeah. So here's the thing is I love it, that. I mean, I'm all in except for the, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the basic thing here is you're going to need six, seven, 8,000 calories a day to fuel all this. And, you know, a lot of like the, 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 you know, the pizzas and, and the McDonald's and all, there's a lot of calories in that. And so if you're training and running a ton, it uh, you luckily burn through a little bit of this. And so I'd like to be doing like the kale salad or whatever, but it just doesn't have the fuel that you need to, uh, to actually you do it. My trainer, I kind of like your method. <laughs> that is awesome. The, uh, did Pam ever tell you about the time she ran across the country? I've heard a little bit. The icebreaker run, that is the stuff of legend. So it is the stuff of legends. And 
She, uh, I always rib her about it. And Pam, if you're listening, uh, boy, Greg has no gear. Um, he's looking to represent. I told him I would tell you to send him some stuff. Um, so get on that. So you're also going to be like, you're going to have a documentary crew with you and then you're going to be stopping in. Do you have like set places already that you're going to stop? Are you kind of still in the planning stages of that? What's that look like? Yeah. So yeah, we, we're, we are still planning stuff, but the, the, the broad shape is coming into view. So COVID of course is a, a big challenge here. Our, one of our chief goals is to not be a vector for the virus. And so we want to do this all safely, which is creating, you know, we're already to plan like D and I'm sure we'll be the EFG before long. Right. But, uh, at high level, we want to travel through places that have been really impacted by addiction. And so, you know, from New York heading west, um, go through uh, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, West PA, and see, you know, some of these communities that have really, really, really struggled. And we, we don't want to just be another part of the narrative of, oh, look at this down and out place. Instead, it's look at the hope that has really taken hold in this place. And so part of what our, our production team is doing is researching and learning more about those inspiring stories. Because in Western Pennsylvania, there are kids that have lost parents to either jail or early yeah. graves that are banding together and helping to literally raise each other. And for me, it's like, wow, like that's part of the story that we need we need to know. And out here in Seattle, we don't hear that part of the story. Uh, and as we go further west, we go through places that have been hit hard, you know, former industrial heartland that is a very challenging transformation. And a lot of folks that lose work, you know, alcohol looks extra enticing when you're kind of down and out, you're not feeling too good about things. And we want to connect again with folks that have really seen the struggle and worked through it. And that are now, you know, being a mentor or being a guide or a navigator or a sponsor to help others as they go. And so uh, sweep through here, you know, Gary, Indiana, Chicago, off through Standing Rock Reservation, uh, Spokane, and then on to Seattle. And in each place, we uh, yeah, want to connect with folks. And then my, I'll actually have a GPS tracker that I'll share. And I would love to actually have folks come out and join for a couple miles, either on foot or on bicycle. And I'd love to hear your story. You know, that's that's really a big part of the aim here is to just connect and show that no matter where you live, no matter your political affiliations, your socioeconomic status, your education, that stuff doesn't matter. Like we are on this together and it's a journey that's a lot more fulfilling when, when we are on the path together. And Julie Rogers just chimed in. She's in Seattle. We were just talking about them. She's yeah. looking forward to seeing you at the finish line. Amazing. And I can't wait to, to jog a couple miles together uh, there as we get into Seattle. And I'll meet you for pizza. Yeah, that's a deal. <laughs> Perfect. Well, Greg, I want to thank you so much for bringing such positive awareness to those struggling and those looking for help. Um, you are a true inspiration, and we look forward to uh, taking this journey with you. So thank you for allowing us to be a small part of it. My pleasure, Kevin. And thank you to everyone in the community for being such a big part of this already. I, I appreciate the encouragement. Awesome. Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks. All right, next up is my man, Matt Gannum, the, also known as The Poet. I'm going to bring Matt in. What's going on, Kev? How are we doing? I'm all right. How are you? I heard you were going to run through Massachusetts with him. Yeah, you're going to do it with me. No. <laughs> I wish. I give that guy a lot of credit, man. I was hearing, uh, just picturing the telephone pole of the trash can and trying to make it just to the next stop all the way across the country. I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> Bring up the time I tried. I ran the Boston Marathon almost without. Training. Oh yeah, you know, it was. I did like five training runs. Chris and mm -hmm. I did it like two jackasses. <laughs> we had no like fuel with us. Nope. Like, mile thirteen, they have the water stations and the volunteers have like a cookout. Yeah. All I could see was cheeseburgers. Oh uh, yeah. Course, grabbed the cheeseburger, started eating it, and then continued running. Oh, you kept going? I would have stopped. <laughs> I would have said, screw this. I'm eating. Yeah, I'm eating and hanging out. A couple miles. Oh, yeah. And then the wheels fell off, and it took me four oh. hours to finish it. Oh, that's torture. It is. But you're yeah. a boss. You should run the marathon for us. Yeah, no, uh, see, running's not my thing, you know, you give me a ball, you want to go play in a basketball court, I'm with it, golf, football, a sport, running is just not appealing to me. I think we talked about this, I'll bust you up on the golf course. I, I'm with it, 
You probably will. I, I'm awful at golf. But golf's the one sport you can play for, like, the rest of your life. So, like, my back's starting to hurt. I can't keep up with the 20-year-olds anymore. Golf is where it's at. You know? So, I'm trying. I'm learning. I've only been playing for a couple of years, but we definitely got to get on the uh, the course together. No doubt. Mm -hmm. Get Rosario to take us out on the guys and all credit card. Yeah, yeah, that's my guy right there. Big shout out to Kevin, recovery yeah. warrior right there. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. you've uh, you just opened the new treatment center in Massachusetts, Aftermath. You want to talk yeah. about that? Yeah, of course. Well, first, I'm a grateful recovering heroin addict. On April 21st, I celebrated 14 years in recovery. Um, blessed and grateful to be here. Uh, it's been uh, a very rocky road the last couple of months for me. I uh, got hit with some adversity, got blindsided by a certain situation that just wasn't prepared for. And, um, you know, when you get hit with adversity and recovery, you know, we get into this like fight or flight mode. And, um, you know, I'm beyond grateful that like because of my recovery network, because of like the people I surround myself with, my family, my friends, they all carried me when like at some points you feel like you want to give up. Or you just feel like, you know, the, the task in front of you was too tall. And, um, you know, I'm so grateful that I have the mentality I gained from getting clean. When I got clean, I felt like I was going to die by 21. Like, I didn't think I was going to make it to, to 35. I didn't think I'd have kids. I didn't think I'd, re, you know, rebuild the relationships with my family. Like, I really, all of this is, is living on borrowed time, right? And um, getting clean from being a homeless heroin addict truly makes me believe I can get through anything. Uh, any obstacle that gets thrown in my way, I'm either going to get around it, through it, over it. It doesn't matter to me. I'm going to find a way. And um, that's kind of how aftermath came to be. Um, you know, the, uh, the definition of aftermath is like, you know, a severe, severe um, event in your life. And, um, you know, it's the aftermath of, of, of the situation that I just got out of. It's the, you know, trying to inspire people to recover and, and, and rise out of the uh, aftermath of the wreckage of their addiction. And um, as a writer, I'm a, um, writing has been like a huge therapeutic tool for me in my recovery. And uh, I use phoenixes and rising out of the ashes as like a huge metaphor. And um, as we, you know, me and me and my amazing uh, team that we have over here, as we were formulating everything, I just, you know, it felt like it fit, you know, aftermath and the Phoenix is the logo, the symbolism of it. It's just like on so many different layers that, um, you know, it just hit home and uh, it's a facility. We opened our doors uh, October 27th. We were licensed. Um, we had one of the quickest turnarounds ever in the state of Massachusetts of when you start going for a license to when we got it. We're in Wakefield, Mass. I can't pronounce our lake that we're on, but we're on this beautiful lake. It's Lake Quinna, Quinna Ponit. I just call it Wakefield Lake. Um, I walk my dogs around here. My mother used to work in this office park when I was a kid. So um, there's like all these different little ties to it. And, um, you know, we opened our doors recently. I got an incredible team. I know Joe Pup is out there. He's tuning in. Uh, one of my best friends, Jenna Pedro, Cody, John Hansen. Um, you know, we got like, this dream team going over here, uh, just trying to like inspire people to, to do better. I mean, that's the, 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 the calling that I feel like, you know, I feel like it's my calling to try to help people, to try to give back to, you know, I know I can't save anybody, but I can try to inspire somebody to do better. Yeah. And, um, you've you know, been doing that for, for years and I'm looking at all the comments yeah. coming in, and there's a ton of people that, yeah. You have touched, you have helped. Our boy Matty P's on here. Matty P, my guy. Speaking <laughs> he of He was another guy. He was a guy talking about cutting me up on the basketball court. Yeah. You know, yeah, we never got that one-on-one -on -one game though. No, he's, he's, yeah. he's, he's yeah. no game. No game. But, None whatsoever. But you know, ideally, I've seen, you know, when I was going to get clean. I would end up in places and people would already, they would down talk me. They would make it like I was less than. Now, I already feel less than going into these places, right? So, like, I don't need to be reminded that, like, I know I'm, I haven't showered in weeks, that I'm, you know, looking rough, probably don't smell too good, probably haven't brushed my teeth. Like, I already know I'm less than human. I don't need to be treated like this. And uh, the mentality that we have over here, similar to what Chris has, similar to what, what heroin wellness brings, we treat people like a person. 
yeah. try to love them up and support them through like their hardest times. Like I know they're going through a hard time. They don't need me to beat them up for the situation that they're going for. It's more like, Hey, this is what I've been through. This is what I did in a situation that was like that, you know, and, and trying to relate and, and build that connection. I mean, connections, like one of the biggest things for recovery. I sat down going through detoxes and programs with people that would, they went to school for this, but they didn't live the experience. So they would try to talk to me in this, in these therapeutical therapeutic terms, but it was like, you, you haven't been homeless. You haven't had the friends die that I've had. You haven't been through the traumas that I've been through. You haven't lived what I've lived. So it's hard for me to let down my guard, let down the walls. Like I just, I buried everything inside. And for me, I was lucky I had an outlet. Like writing has been a huge outlet for me, but not everybody has that outlet. So our approach is trying to just build that connection and try to meet people on common ground. And it's not always about like, Hey, this is the, this is the method of recovery for you that we're going to, you know, force, force feed you. It's more like, where are you at? How can I support you? That's your path. We're going to be like, you know, we're going to be cheering you on the sideline, trying to encourage you to like, you know, chase after a life that you deserve. Cause yeah. you, you know, we don't, and when, especially like the early days of recovery, we already feel like we're less than we already feel like, you know, I'm not even going to get through the night. I want to get high, getting high or getting drunk is the normal to us in those situations. So when all that, that rush of emotion, the feelings, the shame, the guilt, everything that comes, you know, just over you, it's like you, you can either have the support or you can go get support by like the bottle or the needle or the crack pipe. And, you know, we just, we just want to build people up, man. Try to inspire, try to try to help people recover. You know, hopefully people can can see they deserve a better life. And then once they see they can recover, then also pushing them to like go chase after your dreams. Go, you know, go back to school or go step outside of your comfort zone and, and start your own business. Or, you know, just trying to trying to push people to do better, you know? And, and that's the the beauty of recovery is, you know, if you can do this and get sober you can do anything you want to do yeah. and yeah. start a business your own treatment mm -hmm. you can, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is that you want to do you can do it and yeah you know, that's the message that we need to get out there is that message of hope and that anything is yeah. possible and, you know and then, people, and then people can do it and it doesn't have to be the shame attached to it like i know a lot of people you know there's this stigma you can't talk about it you can't you know you got to like hide it. And it's this elephant in the room, the dirty little secret you can't, you can't share. It's like when you own who you are, like it can never be used against you. You can't bring up the past. Like, all right, I don't live there anymore. Yeah. You know, this is where I'm at today. And this is the direction I'm heading. I'm not trying to go backwards, you know? So it's, uh, I, I, I truly think, and I'm kind of going off topic, but I think mm -hmm. if, you know, Bill Wilson were alive in this epidemic, he would have, I think that whole thing on anonymity would have been a little bit different. I think. Oh, absolutely. Have to step outside and mm -hmm. you know recover out loud and show yeah. that recovery is possible. You know, it's it's we have to do that, and you know, no, I definitely. I look at it as a personal calling. You know, mm -hmm. I'll talk recovery. I'll do anything I yeah. can to help someone. It's you know well, we that, have to be out there. If we go back to like when when I was trying to get clean, people went to jail. Like that's how we stop drugs or they die. Yeah. There was no like person preaching like, Hey, come to a meeting or come to this support group, but go to detox. It was like, you would run until you had handcuffs on you. And there was no, no, you know, five, 10 years. There, there was nothing like that because again, going back to what you were talking about, people didn't, that wasn't something people shared. They didn't say, Hey, I, I got sober. I got clean. I turned my life around. You know what I mean? Whereas now it's like so many people are struggling. There's so many people out there that are struggling with drugs, with alcohol, especially when you talk about the epidemic and forced isolation, which is the exact opposite of everything that recovery teaches us with building connections, with the network, with, you know, the common bond left to our own devices. Like a lot of people are, are struggling during this period of time. But like you said, like recovering out loud, it's like, you, you, we, we need to put that out there that people can change, that people can recover, that, that you can turn your life around, that there is hope that's out there because 
often in the news and the media and the way it's covered is overdoses and deaths and, and doom and gloom. And that's, that's all it is. There's no, there's nothing that's positive that's put out there. Like, Hey man recovers for 10 years and, 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 <laughs> and does A, B, C and D and inspires the nation. It's, you know, overdose deaths on the rise. It's, it's the coverage of mass Ave. It's like, you know what I mean? Like there needs to be, you know, the people that speak up for their recovery that try to share like, Hey, you can do this. I know we were talking about Dana earlier. Like, you can do this, Dana. I believe in you. I've seen you, and I know you can do it. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like, I have 100% faith that you can turn your life around. Like, you know, you got to start start trying to trying to move forward, trying to inspire other people and, and building everybody up as a community, you know? I think Dana took a huge first step. Like, I, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't imagine putting myself out th like, there like that. No. And <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, that is the the critical piece of all of this is just kind of getting outside of yourself and saying, you know what, I can't do this myself. I need help. I need others. I need, I'll take whatever I can get. And, you know, for me, I jumped in someone's back pocket. And mm -hmm. for me, it was a 70 year old man that was yeah. you know, 350 pounds that tugged me around the meetings yeah. and told me to, you know, they were a little rougher back then, but mm -hmm. the guy showed me unconditional love and showed me yeah. how to recover. And, you know, it's, uh, but, it's, but that's, that's some of the things that recovery brings you. It's people that don't want anything from you. They don't want your connection. They don't want $50 off of you. They don't want to go out drinking and wasting your life away. It's people that are genuinely there and that want to see you do, do better. You yeah. know what I mean? And pick you up out of like just genuine love. And that's like, for, for me, even with years of recovery being, you know, talking a little bit about the past few months, like I know I'm on, uh, you know, I've I've been blessed with an accomplishment of opening another, you know, uh, the facility aftermath. But in those months before we opened, there was some very, very low lows. And I had people that I could call no matter what. And they were there and, and they supported me and let me talk and let me vent, let me scream when I needed to scream. Let me shed a tear when I needed to shed a tear. And like they loved me through some of like my hottest times and, and constantly you know, drilled in like, Matt, you're going to get over this. You're going to get through this. You're going to accomplish more. And like, that's, it's the same thing when somebody falls, like I'm blessed. I didn't have a relapse in the midst of what I was going through. A buddy of mine ended up falling off. And it's like, I, I saw the two different paths, you know, the fork in the road. Like I, fortunately I picked up the phone, which can be the heaviest thing in the world when I was feeling weak. Cause as you know, Kev, we never want to admit that we're weak. I never want to expose a vulnerable moment in my life. Yeah. And here I am calling people like, I don't know what's going to happen or I'm scared or, you know, fears about like, you know, my kids, my situation, financial stress, like all these different things that I was going through. But I picked the phone up and I had people to support me through that and got to, to be around people. And then I saw the other end where like I had a buddy in a hotel room all banged up, you know, calling me. And it's like, the chaos that was on the other line. I'm like, wow, thank I'm I'm grateful. And that's no knock on him. Cause I know that that could have easily have been me. And I'm only saying that for perspective for people that are, that are tuning in that like, it doesn't matter, you know, years or not months, weeks, whatever, like you can still go through things and fall off. Like I know that I'm not immune to this. I'm not perfect. I'm not cured. Like anything can happen, but the reality of like that situation and what I was going through, it was like, you know, my heart broke for him. And I'm happy he's doing a lot better now, which I'm grateful for. But I just, when you're in the chaos of, of the, the sickness, it was just, it was a moment I was grateful that, that I didn't go down that path. In these and times. I think that's a, you know, a message we all need to hear is, you know, mm -hmm. society doesn't guarantee us that everything's going to be great and bad things aren't going to happen. And we're not going to get stuff thrown at us. That sucks. Mm -hmm. you know, but yeah. Sobriety does guarantee you that, you know, if you're working, your program, you can get through anything and you have mm -hmm. a network of people that you can lean on. You have people you can trust. You can have people you can be yourself around. And, you know, we always say it at Heron Project, together we recover and, you yeah. know, together we can get through anything. And that's mm -hmm. you and I, that's everyone out here listening. It's, yeah, that's you know, the, some of the biggest things is, is when you, you know, for Dana, it's, it's, it's reaching out to people that have time, you know, um, make those phone calls, surround yourself with people that are successful. Um, 
I remember as a kid, my mother always told me who you are, who you surround yourself with. And I lied because my friends weren't the best people. And, uh, you know, I try to cover up for them, but the reality was I hung around with a bunch of drug addicts and, and what, look what happened to me. I, I got high, yeah. right? When you got, when you get clean, like I've surrounded myself with very successful people in recovery that have years, they have knowledge, they have skills, they have tools, they have support. I have that to lean on. Like I want to be a part of that group. I don't want to be the person that's, you know, teetering in and out or, you know, I can't go back to hang out with the kids you know, the people that I hung around with that were getting high because I will get high if I hang around with them. You know, I need to be around people that are like strong in their recovery, supportive, and that will, will hold me accountable when I'm falling off and when I'm messing up. Maddie P in from the cheap seats trying to. Yep. Yep. <laughs> in. I don't know. We'll take him out. I, I seen some comment about, you know, he dominate on the court. I ain't buying it. So. <laughs> He, he doesn't have it in him anymore. No, nah, he's too old. He's washed him. up. Mm. So you're going to do a uh, – I asked you to do a, one of your yep. poems for us. Are you ready to I roll? Got one. I, have, I should have this memorized, but I've, I've, I'm not perfect, so. All right, you're on. I'm more than my mistakes. More than the shame that was once worn on my parents' face. More than my court dates, detox intakes. The living disgrace when jails, institutions, of death was my only fate. I lost my fate. When being a son turns into a junkie. When I sit in my pity pot, swear no one in my family loves me. Playing the victim, but they're just sick and tired all the times I lie. I manipulated them for money. Lied to them for dope money. This time I swear it's going to be different. This time I'm going to change. I don't want to go to prison. This time I'm going to do everything that I did. And this time I'm going to listen my listen. I just need this $40 to shake the sickness. Then I'll go hit up a detox and take care of business. I swear to God with the Lord is my witness. Just let me get a couple of dollars and I'll be clean the next time I visit. I promise, to be honest, I can tell you what the feeling of lost is. Sell your soul and the devil will reveal what the cost is. It's searching for happiness in the bottom of a bottle in the hand of an alcoholic. It's a pile of powder lined up with a straw to sniff. It's dumped out into a cooker trying to suck up all of it. It's losing yourself over the rush. It's destroying every single person you touch. It's a drug lust that even when you get high, it'll never be good enough. The lows are a hole, but you can't stop digging. It was never like this in the beginning. When getting high or drunk felt like you were winning. Now you're not even invited to Christmas or Thanksgiving. Created these circumstances for yourself and played a victim. I've been at the bottom, beaten up and broken down, crying out for help, but no one was around. Hey, mind aren't you proud of your son now? Somehow I managed to burn every bridge I love down. Set fire to my self-destructive ways just so I could burn bright. There I lay in the ashes of a past life, surrounded by worn-down needles and shattered glass pipes. You think I ever want to go back there? You'll never have to ask twice. Tattoos of angels mixed with the ashes of my fallen friends. These scars are like stories written across my skin. Reminded me of where the hell I've been from my darkest days that I never want to go back to again. Shackled by addiction, trying to break free. I stood toe to toe with everything that tried to break me. I started suffocating from the chaos and I couldn't breathe. Another overdose statistic wasn't what I was trying to be. I picked up the pistol and locked in the safety. Then I put a bullet through the throat of my disease just to give myself the chance for recovery. That was fire. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, man. I told you I was going to write one. I got two I lines. know. Do you got one? I got two lines in. <laughs> Let's Ready? hear it. Yep. My name is Kevin. I wore number 11. <laughs> Bars. Bars. <laughs> yeah, well, you're trying, you know, you're trying to work. You're trying to host, write a poem. I mean, it's it's not easy. It's hard. I tell you what I do. do I do do an unbelievable Robin Williams Good Morning Vietnam impression. Hell yeah. I ain't going to do it tonight. but No. <laughs> Too many people on? Oh, I man. I'm going to after that. All I know is there's a lot of love in the comment section. My man, Rob G, big shout out to you, my brother, Jamma. Lisa B, so proud of you. Killing it. Lindsay, Julie, Cassandra, Paul, Dana, proud of you. Victoria, Brittany, a lot got, of love out there. You got Tim Hanall on here, too, another guy. I think. I know, he's a baller. He'll take Matt out. He, he, he embarrassed me at a three-on-three -three, uh, tournament. I can't even lie. He's good. He's real good. He yeah, he nonchalantly was like, yeah, you know what? I haven't picked up a ball in a while. And I'm gassed because I haven't played, you know, I play like a three-on-three -three tournament once a year and I go 100% like a crash dummy. And he's like, yeah, I'm not that good. And he, all of a sudden he's hitting me with fake shots, driving to the rack. I'm like, come on, Tim. 
He's the real friend. <laughs> He's legit. We got another poet in the making. I'm Cassie and I'm super sassy. Get it. I like that. Love it. I so I had that. a, uh, mm -hmm. what would you recommend to a family member that maybe thought one of their loved ones was struggling, um, you know, potentially relapse? What kind of advice would you give? Would you, you know, not say anything? Would you test them? Would you? I mean, you know, Sometimes open communication. I was talking to a mother today that that um, a lot of, of reaction, it's just about support. Like, I love you if you're struggling, like I'm here to talk. Not necessarily. A lot of times when you get put in that situation where a loved one relapse and you end up on, on eggshells and, and you can suffocate somebody and push them further and further away. Where if you think somebody who's been doing good but might have had a couple of slips, it's more about trying to to open the lines of communication. Or I'm here if you need to talk. Maybe leave a, you know some resources for them to um you know to look over and um you know start trying to uh to build that support around them. You know what I mean? Um, not necessarily like confront them in, in a combative way, but more of like a loving, caring way. Like I don't want you know you've changed, behaviors change. You can tell. We're always the last one to know that everybody knows we're getting high. Totally. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, just trying to be supportive and, and letting them know you don't want it to get out of control. And, 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 you know, you're here to help and have like the help on, you know, like, you know, ready, ready to pull the trigger immediately, you know, do some research, set some things up for them in the, uh, you know, in the meantime. So then when they are willing and they come to you and, and admit it, you have the plan of action. You have A, B, C, and D as a, as a route for them. And that way, that way, that window of opportunity when somebody does come around, like when, when we want to get clean, it's so small. It's like, ah, oh, I'm, today I'm going to I'm, I'm gonna go to detox. But then in an hour, you could get a phone call that somebody pulled a score with a ton of money. And it's like, ah, right, you know, I'm gonna get, I'll go tomorrow. I'm not doing it today or I'll do it in two days. So you want to have things ready for when they do come like hey i'm ready now all right cool here's the phone number you get on the phone you call we'll drive you you know let's get it moving in that that positive direction before you know your struggling loved one even thinks about you know going back what's the greatest gift you've received in recovery it's a deep question tough question the greatest gift damn um are we take i mean my kids uh, the best blessing, the greatest gift of, of, of my life. I got a, uh, you know, I got full custody of my 12 year old son, which is incredible for, for a man in the state of Massachusetts. It's not easy. And that's my little guy. And, um, my seven year old daughter is a beautiful, sweet and sour patch kid. She's like absolutely sweet one day and then the devil the next. So she, I'm going to have my hands full with that little diva. Um, but if we're not talking about my kids, the resiliency, that I have has been one of the, the greatest blessings that even like the hottest times that I've faced. And I'm not just talking about recent, like I've lost like some of my closest friends. Like I look around in my group of friends that I grew up with on, there isn't anybody. And, um, the highs and lows of recovery and having the resiliency to push through at the lowest, the low days that I've had. And also like the, the, the wherewithal when I'm going on, when I, when I hit the highs and I have success to not let it, you know, over, you know, Overinflate my ego, I guess. So, yeah. those are probably the, the the you know two things for that question. I would tell people the key to success and recovery is avoiding the big ups and downs. It's kind mm -hmm. of finding your way yeah. through the middle. There's going to be bumps and mm -hmm. twists, but you got to somehow find a way to stay, you know, level. And uh, yeah, no, definitely not too high, not too low. Big shout out to Maddie. <laughs> yeah, you get a lot of you get a lot of support. What would you say to uh someone who's struggling that maybe watching, kind of maybe thinking about asking for help, maybe a little bit on the fence? What advice would you give them? Reach out for help. I mean, that's the, the the biggest and best thing that you can do right now. You already know what it's like getting high. You already know drinking every day, drinking your life away, the homelessness, the the chaos, the desperation. You know what's out there. We all know, like I know if I go out there and get high, there's still the gazebo in Boston Common that I slept in. There's still, you know, crappy lifestyle. 
you don't know is when you reach out, you pick up that phone, you call for help, the blessings that you're going to receive from there, right? You don't know how amazing life can be on the other side of addiction. And one of the things that, that, um, you know, we all struggle with is that we don't, you know, a lot of times we have like no self-esteem when we're getting clean and we don't even, we question if we deserve the life that we live or we deserve the blessings. And like, uh, you know, you pick up that phone, you call for help because you deserve like such a better life than the life that you're living, that you're struggling, uh, you know, that you're struggling to get high, that you're dope sick or that you're drinking your life away. Like, you know, life is such, such a better thing when, when you don't have to like have that ball and chain attached to your everyday life that you don't wake up and your first thought is I need a drink or I need a drink to stop the shakes or I need my first bag, right? There's a freedom in that. And I know like it, it feels like your addiction's like a heavy burden on your shoulders, but like recovery is the freedom from that. And that's like the biggest suggestion I would give for somebody to pick up that phone and reach out for help is that it gives you that freedom from, from everything holding you back. It's, it really is, you know, it's corny, you know, when people say it all the time, but and I'm about to say it right now, but mm -hmm. when you, you would have made your mess when you first got sober of what your life, what you think you wanted out of life, mm -hmm. you be close. Oh my God. It's crazy. If I, <laughs> I, I swear to God, the life that I live today, I never thought I would ever attain, like ever. Like it just, even in recovery, I didn't picture the the blessings that I would get. And, um, you know, it all stems from like, you know, the fact that I stay clean and I try to do the next right thing. That's that's really the, the most simplistic terms that I can put it. And doors of opportunity have opened for me. I try to do right by people. And hopefully that right comes back to me. And like, I've been blessed that, that it has. And yep. I've seen people who are like in the depths of hell, depths of their addiction, come around and, and, and own a house, relationship, marriage, kids, business, success, you know, top of their, their, their uh, field. I mean, you know, we are some of the most talented people on earth. And when you remove like the chase of the drug or the chase, the lying, cheating, stealing, manipulating and drinking, right? And you put that same type of effort into like something positive, like you would be blown away at how beautiful your story will be. We got Johnny Green tuning in too. <laughs> My man, John, how we doing, buddy? Love you, bro. He's a good dude. Mm -hmm. Tara, how we living? Tara's the best. Well, Matt, I want to thank you so much for coming on. This has been great. I thoroughly yeah. enjoyed it. Thank you for all you do for the recovery community. You're a blessing, mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad to know you as a friend. Yeah, no, thank, thank you for having me, Kev. Uh, I appreciate it. We got to get on that golf course. Uh, that's a big thing. Totally. Um, well, Mario, get the GC. Yeah, Kevin, where you at? You know, we getting started, so we need some Gosnall. We need a Gosnall treat if you can help us out with, uh, you know, a little 18 whole course. But, um, you know, anybody out there that's struggling, like, you know, believe that, that you deserve a better life and that, that you can achieve recovery and, and put that effort in. And everybody that's out there doing their thing, like, I'm wicked proud of you. Uh, you know, recovery is truly a blessing. And especially during these these hard times, like if, you know, if you can make it through this forced isolation and stay clean, like, just imagine there's, there's nothing that's going to hold you back, you know. So make sure you're, you're out there supporting each other, building each other up, you know. There it so, is. Positivity, peace, love, and happiness, you know? And Rosario just said he's kicking in, so. <laughs> my man, Kevin. I love Kevin. That's my guy. That's my brother down there. He's my New Bedford. Mm -hmm. But one of the only New Bedford guys I like. <laughs> yeah, don't you guys got a thing? Oh, it's. Oh, it's All River New Bedford, no? Well doubt. Yeah, yeah. That's, yep. right. That's the rivalry. It's uh, we used to have to get state police escorts out of the <laughs> effort for our basketball. Yep, yep. Be throwing rocks at the buses and mm, warfare. No doubt. Yeah, but, but no, thank it heals those relationships. You know, yeah. now we're, we're one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's the truth. All right, you, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me on, Kev. Love you, brother. All right, love you too. Good night. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. That was an amazing show. Thank you to my guests. I will see you all next week. Be well, stay safe. God bless.